just as you take your seat, let me pray. Lord God in heaven, we want to bring you praise, glory, and worship as we draw near to you this morning through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you that for those of us who are in Christ today, that we can say we're saved by grace, we're part of your family, we're redeemed people, that we are set for glory, that that is sure that no one will ever pluck us from the Father's hand. Thank you, Father, for that incredible security that we have today and the wonderful blessing of being uh, part of your kingdom, being saved by grace. And of course, it's all because of what you have done for us through Jesus Christ, our, our Lord and Savior, who we've been singing of and, and worshiping, the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who humbled himself uh, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Lord, we thank you that Jesus lived our life, Lord, that he was without sin, uh, and yet he died that substitutionary, that sacrificial, atoning death in our place, bearing the judgment of God instead of us when he had never sinned, dying and rising again so that we might know eternal life in his name. And Lord, it's on that basis that we draw near to you this morning and, and pray that you would uh, move among us by your Spirit to bless us, to speak to us, to encourage us, and to transform us. Lord, we thank you for the salvation we know in Jesus Christ, but we know, Father, that we're still far from perfect. Lord, we still wrestle with sin day by day. We still dwell in sinful bodies. And Lord, we know that you're patiently and lovingly sanctifying us. You're shaping us more into the image of your Son. And for we give you thanks, but we do pray that you would continue to do that work even today, shaping us in our worship through your word, Lord, shaping us more and more into the people you would have us to be, people who are Christ-like. Lord, reveal those areas of our lives where we need to repent, where we need renewal. And Lord, help us uh, always to put to death what is earthly within us uh, and to put on that new self that is after Christ. But Lord, as always, and we make no apology for praying it, Lord, we do pray for any who are here today or watching online or listening back at a later time, who don't know you, who are outside of your kingdom, who are lost in their sin and iniquity, who are still on that broad road to destruction. And we simply pray that you would show them Christ, that you would show them, Lord, the, the, the beauty and majesty of Jesus, that all he has done for them in order to rescue them from their sin and helping them to repent and to believe in him alone. Lord, we pray that you would uh, continue with us now as we lift our praises. Lord, there's so much, Lord, we could praise you for in the week that has gone by, and we do thank you for how you've spoken, for how you've helped all your servants, for how you've been with us and used us in the different spheres of life in which you've placed us, and even helping us through the ups and downs of the past week, those moments where we fe felt really weighed down by difficulties or frustrations, and even how you've blessed us in those moments where we feel just on top of the mountain that you have really been at work within us. Lord, you're always good. In the, in the positive moments, in the negative moments, you're always good. You're always faithful. You're always sovereign, and you're always shaping us into the image of Christ, and for that we give you thanks. And so, Lord, as we continue now in our worship, we, 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 we long to meet with you, to know you, and to be changed by you. So we pray that you would do that work among us uh, and bring your name glory in all said and done, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Just a, a couple of announcements at this stage before we sing again. Um, just, just You can see up on the screen what's happening uh, in the week ahead. Do, do be praying for those different things. Uh, and engaging in them where you can. But do uh, remember Tuesday night, there's no midweek in the hall. Uh, it's our home groups. Um, we're in, on, in chapter six of Pray Big by Alistair Begg. Um, so we're near the end. Um, the questions should be in the hall, in the foyer, in the porch. And so if you want to grab a set of those questions um, uh, and, and answer them for Tuesday night and go to your normal home group uh, for eight o'clock, that would be much appreciated. Um, then uh, a few additional announcements. Everything else is as normal up on, up on the screen there. So again, do, do be praying for them. Um, 
Abide, the, the ladies' dinner at Kelly Moon uh, on Thursday, the 20th of March at uh, quarter past seven. Uh, I know this was announced on Thursday night, but for anyone who missed that announcement, if you're interested in going, again, there should be a sign-up sheet in the, the porch. Uh, if you want to go, put your name on that sheet, and the cost is uh, £25. Um, so, so do remember that, ladies. Um, Andy announced this last week, but Reach are holding a, a, a special youth event on uh, Saturday the 6th of April in the Bernavon um, at half seven, uh, and Aaron Riddle will be sharing at that. So again, young people, if you're, you're interested in that, I think you do have to sign up, don't you, Carl? Yeah, okay. So there should be a wee link, maybe. Um, QR code? Okay. So yeah, um, you know what to do with that, uh, and sign up uh, if you're interested. And then just a couple of other things Andy mentioned last week. Um, these are in the, in the, the porch. Uh, it's your, your summer by teams and camps, if you're interested. Um, Megan's leading the team. Where are you like, leading the team, Megan? Castle, Castle, okay. So if you want to link up with Megan, hopefully your team's not full yet. No, okay. Spaces in Megan's team, or if you want uh, to serve another team. Um, I think you need to sign up by Friday. So uh, that's the deadline. So grab one of these today and sign up uh, before Friday. And then as you know, today is what uh, is we commonly remember as St. Patrick's Day. Uh, again, this little booklet has been produced by David Luke. Uh, I read it uh, yesterday on, on the way up to Belfast. Um, I wasn't driving. I was, Nicole was driving, and, and I, I took the chance to, to, to read this. Uh, and it's a brilliant well-published, well-written little book, um, lo looking at the myths, the man, and the message, uh, and it's very well-written. There's some of them in the porch. Do grab them and read them yourself, yeah, but, but more importantly, give them to an unsaved friend or family member, maybe someone in work, uh, and, and share, because uh, there's a gospel presentation in it. Do, do, do share it with them. That would be uh, great for you to do that, so do remember that as well. I think that's everything. Um, if I've forgotten anything, please uh, forgive me. <laughs> um, we're going to sing uh, again before we bring the boys and girls up. On that day, um, I will see you. We're, we're thinking of the, that, that future day when we will be with Christ. That's very much going to be mentioned in our, our passage this morning, that, that future glory that we will know in Christ. Uh, and this is a song that beautifully depicts it. Let's stand and, and sing.
And boys and girls, come on up. Uh, make your way up to the front, and uh, Carol's going to share with you. Thank you, Carol. Do you want to be together? Yeah. Super. Could you let her visit or could you come into the next one? Do you want me to be extra quick? Get it? Super. Brilliant. Hannah, do you know what? Could you sit here so then you're near me? You sit in here. Oh, super. Brilliant. Oh, it's a bit of a squash, isn't it, this morning? Do you know what I'm going to ask, Max? Will you do me? He's, <coughs> got, he's going to sit and watch us as well and we'll give a wave out toward her primary school. Could you go to the next seat because we're a wee bit squash. Go you in there to the very end beside Spectacular Miller. <gasps> Go in there, super lovely. Can we slide up so then we have enough room? Right, this boy's going to watch this morning. Lovely. Does he... Max, what's his name? Li... Lino? Oh. Okay. It is... Yeah, it's cool. It's cool, okay. Nice for you to come and join us. Okay. Thank you for coming to church today. It's lovely to see you. Some people I've already seen this morning. I've got a bag of sweets. There might be enough for two. It really all depends how well we're sitting already. <gasps> Look at these two beautiful... I love the way you're sitting. Good job. Thank you for coming to visit us this morning. Now, I've got two things. Is everybody sitting up? Brilliant. Okay, now, this morning, I've got a bowl, and I've got some money. Before I talk about that, I'm going to, okay, if we could have the next slide, Alex, could we, with our verse on it? Now, whenever we come to children, whenever we come to our kids talk, do you know what? We might do fun things like this, but this, boys and girls, is the most important part of our kids talk. Every single Sunday, doesn't matter who's up here at the front, is our verse that we have from the Bible, because that's why we come up to the front to find out a little bit more from God's Word. And this morning, our verse is from Psalm 71. It says, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. So this morning, we're going to talk about hope. And for to do this, I need two things. I have a ball, and I've got some money. But before, before I use that... Do you ever sometimes, maybe you go to school and you're walking into school with your bag and you're thinking, oh, I really hope my teacher's off sick. Well, let's be honest, you're going to say it because then maybe if there's somebody different in then, or maybe you'll say, oh, do you know what I really, I really, really hope that mum has got Nutella in the cupboard because I want to have that in my toast. Or you might think, oh, I hope the teacher doesn't give us any homework. Do you know what I said this morning to some boys and girls? I said, I, I really hope that I'm off school on Monday. Okay. And sometimes whenever we talk about hope, it's really actually, we're not really using the word right, because what we're really talking about is we wish, we wish that actually if we go into school, our teacher's not there, or she's going to say, actually, do you know what, today, P5, no homework. In fact, we're just going to do nothing all day other than play. I know, would not be like lethal, it actually would be, wouldn't it? But anyhow, okay, so to show this a wee bit more, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the ball there. It could go one or two ways. Is it? I love your sitting. Are you turning around looking at Carol? <gasps> That's amazing. Bottom on the seat. Oh, amazing. Okay, so I think Carol knows zero, like zero, about football. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't know anything about But lots of people know lots about it. But sometimes in football matches, I think... <laughs> So if I'm saying this wrong, just say, okay, Carol, you're a bit of a noodle. But that's fine, because it's just like, you know, whenever they say, who's going to go first in the game? And it's just like they throw it up, and it's who says heads or tails. But whenever the person is actually saying heads or tails, they don't actually know which way it's going to go. They're wishing that their team is going to be heads because they want to go first. So it's really a wish. That's the money. Now, if I show you... Oh, second row are actually sitting the best. And actually the third is just Nathan, so he might actually be getting two seats because he's just sitting really well. I love that. Now, 
I have a friend who loves science, finding out about things, and talks about people like Isaac Newton and different things like that there. And if I throw this ball, you might have heard the word gravity. If I throw this ball up in the air, well, then I'll leave, okay? Because then it'll damage something. But if I threw this ball up in the air, I don't wish that it will come down. It will always come down because of the law of gravity. When I throw it, it will always come down. It'll not go further up. It'll always come down. It might go on the ground because this tells me because of gravity, I can hope that the ball comes down because it always will. And in our verse today, we find, oh Lord, you are my hope. And that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about hope and about our hope being in the Lord. We're coming up to Easter time. And already this morning, if you were in Sunday school, we have talked about Good Friday, didn't we? And we were watching a video about on Good Friday that Jesus went to the cross. We talked about Jesus going to the cross. God sent his only son into the world to go to the cross to forgive us for our sins, that we could be rescued from our sin. Not that if we say to Jesus, um, I'd re I really wish that you would forgive me from my sins, we know without a shadow of a doubt, boys and girls, that he will forgive us from our sins because Friday is good because what is coming? Easter Sunday is coming. Easter Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. And because we have that, hope and we know from God's word that he rose from the dead, that he is alive, that he has conquered death. He can forgive us from our sins. Whenever I was a teenager, I didn't pray to God and say, God, I'm really sorry for my sin. I wish you would forgive me. I didn't have to wish because I knew that Jesus would forgive me from, from my sin when I asked him. And when we have our hope in the Lord, boys and girls, this is our last thing. Then we know that he is in control of all things. We know that whatever happens, he will be right beside us and help us, even though maybe sometimes, and we've ta been talking a lot about this, maybe as children, but actually as adults, we've been talking about how sometimes we don't know what's ahead of us, but God knows, because he has a perfect plan for each one of you sitting here, for everybody sitting down in the congregation, everybody listening online, Gareth in the pulpit, all of us. He has a perfect plan for our lives. And we need not fear, boys and girls. We don't need to be worried because if we have said to Jesus, I'm sorry for the sin that I have done, please forgive me, rescue me from my sin and help me to live for you, then we know without a shadow of a doubt that we have a hope that can last all time. So this week, maybe whenever you go into school, you might use the word, oh, I hope this or I hope that. I want you to remember about this verse from Psalm 71. My hope is in the Lord. Now, you've sat really, really well. Just before we go back, I'm going to put the ball down. And let's see. Well, if I throw it, then actually somebody might get hurt. So I'm not going to do that. I might do it later on. Okay. Okay. P R. Uh, why, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning for all the boys and girls who are here. Maybe there are some boys and girls who are not here this morning because they're at home and they're not feeling very well. But we just want to thank you for every boy and girl sitting here right now. Thank you, Father, we, that we have a hope in you. And Father, whenever we ask you to forgive us from our sins, that we know without a shadow of a doubt that you will forgive us. Help us this week in everything that we do to live for you and to shine for you. For we ask these things all in your name. Amen. Now, let's see who, as we get ready for Krish, I'm going to start. I'm going to start here. Nathan, amazing.
Carol. Um, it's not wonderful to know that um, it's not a, a fleeting thought that you might be saved, that if you trust in Jesus, repent and believe, you will be saved because it's a promise uh, of God. Um, at, at the pastor's conference there recently, um, the speaker did this uh, interesting experiment. He got us, I think there was, was there about 150 or so there? He got us all to stand up and then he went through the ages of people when they were saved. And by the time he got to around the age of 20, there was only seven people standing. And the um, vast majority were saved as kids. And I think that is an incredible lesson. So no, for me and Andy, we found it a real challenge, you know, what an opportunity we have to share the gospel with our kids at home, in church, here on a Sunday. And let's pray for our children. That's an important message, um, the salvation that we can know Christ. Thank you, Carol. We're going to sing again before we, we turn to God's word uh, collectively. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. <clears throat> let's stand and sing.
Let me encourage you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Um, this is the, the uh, sermon in this series, Fight the Good Fight. We'll be finishing it, God willing, next week before we have a, 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 an Easter message and starting another series. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll read the first eight verses. This is God's Word. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry." For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing." Father in heaven, we thank you for Paul's letter, second letter to, the, to Timothy. And Lord, thank you for the lessons that we have learned from it so far. And Father, we pray that as we think of this final charge of, Tim, of Paul to Timothy, that Lord, you would stir our hearts concerning how we are using and investing our lives and our time, which is short whether we're investing our lives in the building of your kingdom or not. Stir our hearts, Lord. Reveal areas where we need to repent and seek renewal. But Lord, most importantly, shape us. Shape us into the people you would have us to be, people who make disciples of all nations. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you have been imprisoned for your faith in Christ. Even more than that, you're on death row. You're going to be executed simply for proclaiming the good news of the gospel. Yet before your execution, you're allowed to write a final letter to your loved ones. If you were in that situation, what would you want to say? What message would you be keen to get across to your loved ones? Well, I imagine most of us would want whoever it is we're writing to to know that we love them. That's a good thing. Perhaps we'd also want to encourage them to have a good life to appreciate every moment and to strive for happiness. But in light of our current predicament, would we be as eager to encourage our loved ones to live faithfully for Christ and to boldly proclaim the gospel? Would that be high on our agenda, on our list of priorities in that letter? Last words are incredibly significant. They give us the unique opportunity to pass on something important. And what we have here are the last words written by the Apostle Paul to a young man 
that he loved like his own son. You see, at this moment in time, Paul was imprisoned in Rome. And as we know, there was nothing unusual about that because Paul was often imprisoned for his faith in Christ. Yet this was different. This imprisonment was different in the sense that Paul knew he wasn't going to be released this time. He knew that execution was imminent. And so with that in mind, what did Paul want to say to Timothy? Was he keen to encourage this young man, live a good life, be happy, build a home, a family, enjoy yourself? Well, there's no mention of such things in these verses, is there? Not that they're unimportant. They're not. But because Paul knew they weren't the most important things. You see, as Paul drew near the end of his life, his greatest concern, as we've seen, was the continued advancement of the gospel. And with this in mind, he wrote this letter to Timothy to exhort him to live faithfully for Christ and to keep boldly proclaiming the good news of the gospel. For in Paul's mind, that was the most important message to pass on to this young man that he loved like a son. And this message comes to this crescendo here in these verses as Paul, ex as, as Paul exhorts and charges Timothy to do two things. Preach the word. Keep the faith. And that's our, our headings this morning. So firstly, he exhorts him, preach the word. When I was younger, my dad occasionally came to watch me playing football. And when I knew that my dad was coming, it motivated me to try harder. Why? Well, because I wanted to make him proud. Well, that's essentially what Paul is doing here as he reminds Timothy about the presence of God. He says in verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God. You see, God was the one who had ultimately called and commissioned Timothy to preach the word in the first place. Therefore, Paul charged Timothy to preach the word in the presence of God to not only remind him, this is what you've been called to do as a Christian, but to also motivate him, keep doing it, keep going, keep pressing on, keep fighting the good fight. Yet Paul also reminds Timothy that he was living and serving in the presence of Jesus, who will one day return to judge the living and the dead. Now again, Paul reminds Timothy of this truth in order to motivate him to keep going, to keep faithfully preaching the word. You see, Timothy, along with every believer for that matter, will one day appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive what is due for what we have done in our bodies. Now, of course, Timothy's salvation and our salvation is secured by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. It's not our works that save us from the judgment of God. But as believers in Christ, we will be rewarded in glory on the basis of the works that we've done in the flesh. And so by charging Timothy in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus to preach the word, Paul was giving him all the motivation he needed to keep going. It's worth it. You see, as we've thought about in recent studies, there will be hardship for followers of Jesus in the last days. Not only will there be false teachers who seek to undermine the gospel that we proclaim, but every believer who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Yet this hardship should never result in Timothy or any other believer neglecting their responsibility to preach the word. For the scriptures are not only sufficient to make us wise for salvation, but they're also profitable to mature us in Christ and to equip us for every good work. 
And so we need to be faithful in sharing the Word of God. In fact, there's great urgency in this charge. Look what Paul says. He says, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And so Timothy wasn't to waste time. He couldn't be lazy in this department. Instead, he was to be ready at all times. And indeed, he was to be eager to get on with the very task that he had been called to do, which was preaching the word. For as we saw last time, it's the word that changes people. And so whether it's convenient or inconvenient, whether people are willing to receive it or not, and whether we feel like doing it or not, we should never stop preaching the Word. Now, of course, the reason for this was because Timothy was dealing with matters of life and death, matters of heaven and hell. You see, there's never an inconvenient time for an unbeliever to hear the good news of the gospel. But likewise, there is never an inconvenient time for a believer to share the gospel. And so he wasn't just to preach the word when he felt like it, when people were clearly listening, or when he had the time to do it. No, he was to be ready to preach the word at all times, in season but also out of season. Yet Timothy wasn't just to be ready to share the gospel with unbelievers. He also needed to be ready to teach believers the truths of Scripture through reproving and amending error, rebuking and correcting sin, exhorting and encouraging growth and perseverance. Notice how that coincides with what Paul says the Scriptures are profitable for at the end of verse 3 that we thought about last week or two weeks ago. Very simply, Timothy was to be marked by this readiness at all times. He was never to be lazy when it came to sharing God's Word. Yet as he did this, he needed to be marked with complete patience. For at the end of the day, it's only God who can take His Word and use it by His Spirit to change lives. But why was Timothy always to be ready and eager to preach the Word? Well, Paul goes on to show us. Look at verse 3. He says, He says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. You see, there always has been and there always will be hostility to the Word of God. Always. After all, unbelievers do not like being challenged in their sin. Unbelievers do not like being told that it took the death of the very Son of God to save them. And so people inevitably give up on sound teaching. They turn to other forms of false teaching, exchanging truth for messages that make them feel good about themselves. Because let's be honest, the bad news of the gospel, that we are sinners, wretches who deserve hell, that's not a message that makes you feel good about yourself, is it? And so people turn away from that message because they don't like it, and they chase after messages that make them feel good about themselves. Love yourself. Make yourself a better person. Live for yourself. And who knows, one day you might receive glory. But even within the church, this can be the case. You see, the faithful teaching and preaching of God's Word will not only encourage believers, but it will also challenge us in those areas of our lives where we're not living consistently with God's Word. Now, the majority of believers, praise God, will respond to this challenge prayerfully and repentantly. 
But for some, it can lead to anger. Because yet again, people don't like being challenged in their sin, even believers. And over time, believers can even subtly turn away from sound teaching in order to pursue the kind of teaching that tickles their ears and allows them to be more comfortable in their faith. In fact, it can even result in them regularly jumping from church to church to try and find a teaching style that suits their passions and makes them feel comfortable. Yet in spite of this, Timothy is exhorted, persevere. Look at verse 5. Paul says to him, as for you, always be sober-minded, Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. You see, it's very easy to become intoxicated by the desire to be liked, the desire for people to like you. And so when you see some new teaching gaining this large following of people, you might be tempted to alter your message to make it more palatable and attractive so that you also gain that following. Or alternatively, you might be tempted to tone down the challenging side of your preaching in order to keep people happy. I mean, that's what many of the false teachers in Paul's day did. But instead of wavering from the truth, Timothy is exhorted here, continue to faithfully preach the Word of God. And as he did this, it would inevitably invite hardship into his life. For in the same way as Paul found himself imprisoned and facing execution, For simply proclaiming the Word of God, Timothy could potentially find himself in the same position. Yet that shouldn't cause him to lose heart, and it certainly shouldn't tempt him to give up. Instead, he was to keep preaching the Word. He was to keep doing the work of an evangelist, living out the gospel, speaking the gospel. Very simply, Paul is exhorting Timothy here, fulfill your ministry. Do not overlook your responsibility and your calling to preach the Word. Now, of course, this is primarily being applied to Timothy as a pastor. And so, the initial application of this text is to those set aside by God for pastoral ministry. In other words, pastors are called to preach the Word, to be ready in season and out of season to share the good news of the gospel whether it's convenient or inconvenient, whether you feel like doing it or not, whether people are willing to to listen or not, whether you're preaching to hundreds of people or five people. We're never to abandon our calling to preach the Word. And as we do this, we must always be marked with patience, not letting the apparent lack of response discourage us or to tempt us to give up but always trusting that God's Word will not return to Him void. Very simply, we must fulfill our ministry. No matter how discouraged we may be or how much suffering we're confronted with, we must remain faithful to God's call upon our lives to preach the Word. That that not only means challenging unbelievers to repent of their sin, to trust in Jesus, but it also means reproving, rebuking, and exhorting believers towards maturity in Christ. Yet while this text applies primarily to pastors, the principle being spoken about here actually applies to every believer in Christ. For at the end of the day, we're all called to preach the Word, Hold on a minute, Garth. I'm not called to preach the Word. You are. Maybe not from a pulpit, but you are called to be ready in season and out of season to share the gospel. We're all called to do that. We may not do that again in a pastoral setting or from a pulpit, 
but we are called to be shining lights wherever God has placed us. And so in the family home, in the workplace, in school, in university, in the community, in our friendship groups, in the local church, we should be ready and indeed eager to share the Word of God. Whether it's convenient or inconvenient for us, whether people are willing to receive it or not, whether we feel like doing it or not, we must never abandon our call to be ambassadors of Christ. Again, we are called to fulfill our ministry in this life. And so your ministry might be bringing your children up in the gospel. Your ministry might be teaching boys and girls as a Sunday school teacher or a youth leader. Your ministry might involve being a witness among your fellow employees and work. Your ministry might be shepherding God's people as an elder. Your ministry might involve drawing alongside younger believers to mentor and disciple them in their faith. Your ministry might be encouraging believers who are struggling physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. Whatever your ministry may be, we're called to fulfill it and to never give up. To share the word in season, out of season, with great patience, trusting that God will impact, that God will transform lives in His way, in His timing, by His grace. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to spend our lives doing. There's no retirement when it comes to preaching the word. We're to do it until the Lord returns or He calls us home. That's what Paul is telling Timothy here. Preach the Word. But secondly, he's telling him to keep the faith. You know, as a pastor, I often see people in the final moments of their lives. And on each of those occasions, I always have the same thought. The reality that the only thing that truly matters on that final day is Jesus. Doesn't matter what family you have around you, while that is a beautiful thing, because they can't help you as you enter eternity. It doesn't matter how big your house is or how much money you've got sitting in your bank account, because you can't take it with you and it cannot help you on that final day. The only thing that matters at the end of life is Jesus. And for me, that puts everything into perspective because it reminds us that we can invest our lives in building our own little kingdoms here on earth, but it's all meaningless in the end. Therefore, we should learn to invest our lives in the building of God's kingdom. Well, as he prepares to die, that is essentially the message that Paul is passing on to Timothy. This is why he doesn't use his last words to encourage this young man, go and live a happy life, build a family, build a home, enjoy yourself. Well, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But Paul knows as he draws near the end of his life, those things aren't the most important. And so he uses his last words to charge Timothy to invest his life in Jesus and the proclamation of the gospel. For while everything else we invest our, our, ourselves in ultimately comes to an end and is left behind at the point of death, investing our lives in the building of God's kingdom will bring us heavenly and eternal reward. I mean, this is what Paul did. He invested his life in the building of God's kingdom. And this godly investment meant that when he was confronted with the reality of his own death, he didn't lose heart because he knew the best was yet to come. And that's why he's able to speak about his life and death with such beautiful imagery. Look at what he says. He says, for I am already being poured out 
as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Paul likens his life and his impending death to that of a drink offering. You see, in the the, the Old Testament sacrificial system, a, a drink offering was given as a sign of your devotion and your worship to the Lord. And so, what Paul is saying here is that his whole life has been a drink offering to God, poured out to him in love and in worship. And even now, as he prepares to die, he saw his execution as an offering of devotion and worship to God. He then describes his impending death as the time of his departure arriving. Now, our English translations don't capture the beauty of the imagery being used here, for the idea he has in mind here is of loosing a ship from its moorings. That's a beautiful picture of a believer's death, isn't it? The anchor has been lifted, and we set sail into the sunshine of glory. Clearly, this was a man ready to meet his Lord and Savior. For as he declared in his letter to the Philippians, death isn't the end for believers. Instead, it allows us to be with Christ, which is far better. Very simply, death is our journey into the glory of heaven. What comforting words for those of us today who have lost loved ones in Christ. Paul then triumphantly declares, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Again, isn't this wonderful imagery? He likens the Christian life to a boxing match, to a a, a race, and he uses these pictures to portray his perseverance for Christ. You see, just like a boxer grows weary after receiving many blows in the fight, or, or a runner grows tired as his legs or her legs get, get heavy in the race. There were many moments when Paul was struggling so much that he wanted to give up. I mean, let's not forget that Paul had endured beatings, imprisonments, and accusations for proclaiming the gospel. Yet even though he felt at times like giving up, he kept going. He kept fighting. He kept running in the strength of the Spirit. And this really, these images sum up this final statement. He says, I have kept the faith. For in those moments when, when, when walking away from gospel ministry would have been easier, and it certainly would have made his life more comfortable, Paul stood firm. And he remained faithful to the task that God had called him to. Even when confronted with imprisonment and potential execution, Paul still refused to walk away from the call of God in his life. Very simply, Paul had guarded the good deposit entrusted to him, and he had spent his life faithfully passing it on to others. But why? In light of everything Paul had endured for proclaiming the gospel, why didn't he just give up? Or at the very least, why didn't he take his foot off the pedal? What was it that motivated Paul to keep fighting, to keep running? Well, very simply, it was his assurance of the heavenly reward that lay before him. Look at verse 8. Henceforth there is led up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on the final day. You see, for every athlete, the prize is greatly valued, isn't it? It's it's the prize that, that what spurs them to keep going when things get tough. The thought of being victorious, winning that crown, that medal, that trophy. Well, Paul shows us here that the same was true in his life and in his ministry. Only he wasn't longing for this physical crown that perishes. Rather, he was longing for a crown of righteousness that endures forever. You see, Paul knew that he was forgiven in Christ. And so he knew that no matter what verdict hung over him in his life, the only verdict that mattered was how he stood before God, forgiven 
clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so he knew he had nothing to fear in death, but everything to be excited about because he was going to be with Christ in perfect righteousness. Well, Paul reminds Timothy of these things in order to encourage him. Keep fighting the good fight. Keep running the race. And ultimately, keep the faith. You see, Paul knew that Timothy was going to be confronted with great hardship for following Jesus and for sharing the gospel. Paul knew that in those moments, the human nature within us wants to run away and give up. He'd been there. And so he reminds Timothy here of the bigger picture, the eternal reward. After all, this is the ultimate motivation for endurance in all gospel ministry, the crown of righteousness. I think it's summed up in a lot of ways in Paul's famous words to the Philippians, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. How undefeatable is that declaration? And of course, this not only applies to Timothy here in this setting, but it also applies to us today. For when Paul speaks about the crown of righteousness that will be awarded to him, he finishes that verse by saying, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You see, this future reward is not just for great servants like Paul and Timothy. It's for servants like you and me. And so in the same way as this future reward motivated Paul and Timothy to keep fighting the good fight, to keep running the race, and to keep the faith, it should motivate us to do the same. Maybe today you are a discouraged preacher, a discouraged Christian parent, youth leader, Sunday school teacher, elder, deacon, or witness, who feels as if your gospel ministry in those places isn't making a difference. Well, let me encourage you in the same way as Paul encourages Timothy here. Keep going. Don't give up. Preach the word. Keep the faith. For not only is God using you in ways beyond your understanding, but he is also preparing an eternal reward for you that is beyond your imagination. And so let those truths sink into your heart and motivate you to keep pressing on in your ministry, especially in those moments when you're confronted with hardship or when you just feel discouraged. If you were on death row for following Jesus, what would be the key message that you'd want to pass on to your loved ones? Would it be the simple encouragement, live a good life, appreciate every moment, strive for happiness, Again, there's nothing wrong with such things, but surely as Christians, the key message we should want to pass on is the fact that living for Christ and the spread of His gospel is infinitely more valuable than anything in this life. For the only thing that truly matters at the end is what we've done for Jesus. As C.T. Studd famously said, only one life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Not what's done in the workplace, not what's done in the home, not what's done in the sports field or whatever. Again, there's nothing wrong with investing yourself in those things, but the only thing that lasts is what's done for Christ. But of course, not everyone will love Christ's appearing. And with this, I finish. If you're not a Christian today, you should be fearful of Christ's appearing because there's not a crown of righteousness awaiting you but an eternity of judgment. <coughs> Yet even though that's what we all deserve in our sin, there's salvation to be found in Jesus. For while the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so if you're not a Christian today, I urge you, to repent of your sin and to look to Jesus alone in faith. Because on the last day of your life, the only thing that will matter is what you've done with Jesus.
Nothing else will matter. You don't know when that last day will be. That's why today is the day of salvation. Because we do not know if tomorrow will come. Believe in him today. Amen. We're going to sing in response before we meet around the table. Christ is mine forevermore. Father, we thank you for the blessing of your word. We thank you for how it teaches us and encourages us, but also how it challenges and changes us. And Lord, we pray that we would all search our hearts, myself included, 
to determine, Lord, whether we're investing our lives in the kingdom to come. Help us to be faithful in our call to preach the word and to keep the faith. Lord, it's not easy living for Christ, and we know that all who desire to live a godly life for Christ Jesus will be persecuted, and the human nature within us wants to run from that and seek comfort. But help us, like Paul, like Timothy, to stay true to our call in Christ, to keep fighting the good fight, to keep running the race, and to keep the faith. Help us to do that, Lord, in the strength of the Spirit and in the grace of God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.